This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Christopher, what's up? Welcome to the early morning edition of Remote Ruby. Yeah, which goes out same time as every time. <laughs> but for it's, us, we should start recording live at 7 a.m. How early is it for you, chaps? Well, I should probably know, but it's not early for me. It's nine. It's not It's not that early. <laughs> oh, it's so early. I feel for you. <laughs> yeah. We usually record at two. So it's probably better to record in the morning because my mind's less, maybe mush, more infiltrated. I don't know. <laughs> Violent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the secret to Andrew. Andrew's not here today, but maybe we should start recording in the morning so he's less triggered. He's had less time in the day for things to grind his gears. Maybe he's just sleeping right now. I think he's the gears all, grinding is part of the appeal, isn't it? That's kind of... It is. People only listen to this thing because of Andrew. Sorry, folks. Replacement Andrew this week. Well, you are Andy. We'll go ahead and say welcome, Andy Kroll. Hello. To Hello. This, welcome. this European edition of Remote Ruby. Automatically 20% more sophisticated. It is. <laughs> it is. People have not already stopped listening. Well, I did find Andrew's shorts in my bag. Oh, yes. Thought... I stole Andrew's shorts. And then also on my desk, Andy sent me a copy of Wise God to Ruby, a hard copy. So thank you for that, Andy. No problem. I have another, just in the background, just down here, I have another 15 or so from oh, wow. this year's Brighton Ruby. So I am going to do the Twitter and then dance to the post office. It's quite expensive to send things to the US now. I know that is that a Brexit thing or is that just like you got it's the post? How does that work? Inflation, US inflation. Oh, well, don't talk to me about that. Things, you know, <laughs> yeah. things are heard- not so great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We should save that for our remote politics podcast. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm grateful to have this book because, I don't know, laziness, ADHD. Every time you tweet about, hey, I have these, I'm like, oh, I need to like message him. And I never do. So I actually like hijacked a thread you had with Evan Sparkman the other day. I was like, oh, yes, let's do this. <laughs> well, he was organized enough to remember when I said I don't have any, but I probably have somewhere in a box, he remembered enough to go back and say, I will actually get back in touch with him in three weeks, like he said. And he did. I have a to-do list. And typically what happens is it reminds me enough until I realize this isn't important and delete it. But it's usually yeah. like important stuff like pay business taxes, things like that. So, yeah. It's like important to have a list where things go to die, right? That's what to-do lists are. <laughs> or a backlog, as you like to call it, in our professional <laughs> yeah. worlds. Yeah. <laughs> I made a whole base camp project for a project that took like four hours. So I'm very professional. I was organized. I like it. It's something. It's madness. Andy, you have so much going on. Let's start with a thing coming up. So RubyConf Mini, you are a part of this thing, right? You're one of the organizers? Accidentally, really. So Gemma, who's sort of the true force behind it, she was at Brighton Ruby and we were having a chat about the situation with RubyConf Houston and how Texas isn't necessarily a place that everyone feels great to go. Not that people should feel bad about going, but there was a sense certainly from Gemma and from me that it would be good to have an alternative for people who didn't want to go to Texas and attend that event. So I think broadly speaking, Gemma has all the ideas and we get in touch every now and then and I sort of nod and say, yes, that's absolutely right. That's exactly what I would do. So I don't know, I'm sort of like a useless Jiminy Cricket on her shoulder cheering on and chipping in where I'm not getting in the way, basically. It's not going to be as big as a big RubyConf. Those big Ruby Central events are hundreds of people. Like I think RailsConf's like 1,200 and RubyConf's typically somewhere in the 600 to 800 people. RubyConf Mini is more sort of regional sized in terms of it's going to be a couple of hundred people, although I think they have room to expand if they sell enough tickets. So please go and buy a ticket to RubyConf Mini. And it's all run through Ruby Central, like Gemma and I, on a call with the Ruby Central folks and we're like, we're willing to do the legwork for this if you're willing to sort of like catch us should we fall, not that we're going to fall. So that it's not just landing on Gemma's personal bank account and so that we can utilize some of the expertise at Ruby Central as well. But yeah, it's mostly Gemma and I'm just cheering on from the side and I'll go along and smile and shake hands in Providence. What you're saying is they brought you on to be the face. The face, the voice, the look. <laughs> the voice, there's that sophisticated thing again. <laughs> And there is a sense check and to reassure Gemma that actually running events isn't as scary as it sometimes seems when you're doing it on your own. 
there's loads of other folks involved already. Like we're doing the guides and scholars thing. And so there's folks from the community doing that. Emily's there doing loads of speaker stuff. And then there's support from the Ruby central folks that like, it's very much a team thing. And I'm very much a backseat driver. I'm like the kid in the back of the car. Are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly, can we go? How long till we get there? I mean, everybody, everybody needs that, right? They need that. When my kids do it, I think, oh, goodness me, I definitely needed that. That's not the reason I put it. (laughs) All my kids in the car on long trips. So that's coming up and I'm super looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. And I think there's another wider thing, which is just like, you know, the great return of the regional conference. It is hard to run these things over a length of time. And I think one of the ambitions that Gemma and I have to come out of this thing is taking her expertise from running this and my years of dogged service running Brian Ruby and try and package it up so that people can take the things that we've learned and run their own stuff. The more conferences there are, the better for me. I don't know if you noticed the pandemic was kind of miserable being shut in your house. Again, you know, children. I think there's definitely a case that having that sort of toolkit for other folks to go out and do their own stuff. I know Andrew from Bullet Train is doing a tremendous job with Rail SAS. I've had a good chat with him about his ambitions for that conference and stuff. And it's got a great lineup and I'm already using my spousal conference tokens on Yuruko and RubyConf Mini, so I can't go to Rails House as well as much as I would like to. But yeah, I think it's a really good time in our community for sort of in-person events. Like we've all sort of emerged from our houses going, do you know what? Even if it's only once a year, I like to see other programmers in person. We're all like secret once a year introverts. Right. So why not be amongst your people? And the more opportunity there is to do that, the better. And more chances for more people to speak and get out there in front of people and test their ideas and all that good stuff. Like, yeah, I think hopefully more of this stuff would be great. Yeah, the regional conference is something I enjoy. When I got into Ruby early 2010s, they were starting to like phase out and I was sad. I felt like I had missed an era and then they started to kind of like creep back in. And then, yeah, the pandemic happened. I think I would love to see more regional conferences. When is Ruby Conf Mini? Uh, it's November 15th to 17th in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. Is that at the same time as RubyConf Houston or are they kind of spaced they're, out? They're spaced out. So RubyConf Houston is the beginning of December. It's post Thanksgiving. I think there was an idea that we might do them at the same time, but I think logistically it just felt better to do them apart. Even if there's like centralized admin help from the Ruby Central folks, it means that it's not all happening at once. They're not trying to run a conference in person and also manage another conference that's happening in a different city with other people who they're not on top of. Also, my presumption is some folks will go to both. It's different lineups entirely. I think apart from Nadia, my friend Nadia is keynoting both of the Ruby comps. It's a power move from Nadia. She's, she's, she's going to be a real sass too, right? Yeah, she's reaching for the throne. That's what I'm saying. It's Game of Thrones and Nadia is winning. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So it's cool that you have like Ruby Central support for all this, especially kind of just bringing a conference to life for the first time. Is Ruby Conf Mini something you think is unique just to this year with the situation? Or is it something you think you could maybe see happening again in the future? I mean, I don't know about the situation for RailsConf next year. My presumption is actually that maybe it doesn't need to happen again, but it turns into its own thing. I don't want to speak for Gemma. It's kind of her bag. It's quite difficult as a British person to organize a conference in an American city you've never been to before. I mean, I'm not going to be carrying it on in anything other than a supporting role, but like, yeah, I'd love to see Gemma grab it and turn it into something else, into its own thing. Like, why can't it be its own thing? I guess my question for all the conference stuff, Rails and RubyConf are so dominant, they're so big. And RailsConf, it kind of makes sense, I guess, for it to be a big thing. But, you know, RubyConf itself could be three smaller events. Why does it have to be one big event once a year? Why not have a roving RubyConf? Why not have the RubyConf support given out to lots of regionals? Like, you know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons. Like, they're quite expensive to attend. Like, if you don't have a full-time job with a supportive CTO, then they can be quite expensive to attend. Because obviously the best thing to do for the conferences is to book the hotel in the conference hotel because that's how the conference makes its money back. The mechanics of conferences in the US are different to how I do them in Brighton. But yeah, the best thing you can do is like book the hotel that the conference is in because that helps pay for the conference. That was a mistake we made the first two years of Southeast Ruby. The first year we got a venue, mostly because the venue is named Ruby and it was so expensive. We lost so much money that year. And the next year... We did it at a company in Nashville or outside Nashville. And they were like, you can use our building for free. So like tickets were more affordable. 
And then the third year we were like, oh, we should do a hotel with like a room block. And it was like our most expensive year maybe, but it just made the most sense. I don't know. Certainly the first couple of years I went to a RubyConf, I tried to save money on the hotel by staying further out and getting an Airbnb. And since then, I've always tried to book in the hotel where the recommendation is, just because then you're going full on for the conference. Certainly those big ones, that makes a difference to me anyway. I heard the hotel at RailsConf was great. It was fine. (laughs) It's more about being in the location where there are lots of people who are also at the thing. Like that's the reason I'm going to these things is the hallway track and the hallway track isn't just in the conference venue. It's also in the hotel venue if the hotel isn't the conference venue as well. A hundred percent. The first RailsConf and RubyConf I went to, I stayed off site. The first time I stayed at the hotel and it was just like, walking back to my room and just see tons of people sitting at the bar or in the lounge and people like you're kind of like Ruby idols just hanging out and you can go talk to them. I was like, okay, this is where I need to be like from now on. Spoilers, they're normal people too. I uh, used to believe, yeah. <laughs> I, fact, Aaron Patterson, normal human. Fact, Eileen, also normal human. These people will happily have a chat with you about the things that you're doing with the cool stuff they make, right? That's true of all of us, right? Andy, you were one of my first people I elevated to a pedestal because you gave a talk at RailsCon. I was like, oh, this guy's a genius. I'm very impressive. But to be fair, when it comes to <laughs> slides, I do think my slide game is pretty good. If you've never seen a talk that I've given, like, I am a lot better at Keynote than I am at programming. That's <laughs> my key gift to the world is uh, transitions and skeuomorphism in uh, Apple presentation software. That's what I bring. That's an important skill to have. Maybe more important than knowing Ruby. (laughs) None of my talks recently have been specifically about Ruby. So also maybe don't come if you're looking for that. (laughs) Well, I'm excited that Ruby Company is happening. I'm still undecided which one I'm going to, but I'm leaning towards Mini, but I have to talk to Andrew. His conference spouse. Yeah, Yeah, pretty much at this point. It was RubyConf last year. It was the first time like Andrew and I like hung out in person and we've been attached ever since. It's a beautiful story. Taylor's eldest time, isn't it? My like most excited moment in the past like two months is when Andrew and my wife got to meet. I was like, <laughs> mostly because now when he says absurd things to me, I can like screenshot it, send it to Shannon and be like, you understand now, like you get it. I have to work with this guy all the time. <laughs> He's a real gem. Okay, so you're part of organizing a conference. You also are doing what appears to be from the outside a rather large now initiative to help mentor junior developers. You want to talk maybe a little bit more about the Ruby Friends program? So this was born out of frustration as so many great projects are. I was at RailsConf and they did the thing where they, which I've done from the stage as well, which is you go, who here has, is it their first RubyConf, and then a third of the people invariably put their hands up. You're like, no, obviously, they're not all new to Ruby. They're just new to that conference. But a good percentage of those folks must be fairly new to Ruby or Rails. And seeing, you know, all my people meant that I really um, felt frustrated that as a friendly group of people, we do a terrible job with bringing new people into our community. And I think it's an industry-wide problem. I think most, to be fair, it's an all-work problem. Most companies doing things are bad at bringing in new people and teaching them to do the thing. Programming naturally is a complex and beautiful thing. So it's equally hard to bring people in to do that. And yet in the Ruby community, we benefit from the fact that it's Ruby such a great teaching language that lots of the boot camps use it to teach people how to be productive really fast in that kind of classic Rails way. And I think fundamentally for our community health, it's important for us to be a pathway into a programming career for those folks who've already decided, you know, they've already shelled out in many cases, thousands of dollars or pounds to go on this 12 to 16 week course to go from nothing to pretend social network rails app, which is typically the final project at a bootcamp. And so I thought, well, what's the first thing I can do? Well, I can't fix the hiring industry yet, but I can do this thing and sort of almost like weaponize the friendliness of the Ruby community. Whenever you speak to people, they're like, oh, yeah, I'd love to do some mentoring, but you know, my place of work isn't a good place to hire juniors. And first of all, is that bullshit? Because I think it might be bullshit. You know, I've been guilty of saying that myself. Like, I've been guilty of saying, oh, you know, it's a complex time for us at Coverage Book. And like, there's only a couple of us in the team and we try and stay small. I don't want my job to be just management. I like programming. I'm still doing programming every day. 
So I was like, well, what can I do to test that theory? So, you know, I am going to hire some juniors this year. And also this mentorship program just sort of like vulnerable. What could people give up? Like people would give up like six hours over six months. They'd give up that time, even six half hours over six months. They'd give up that time to be friendly to a new person. Like you do that at a conference. That's one of the nice things about a Ruby conference. Like people who go to them go, oh, wow, I had no idea that the Ruby community was so friendly. And I do think that's unusual. And I really wish I knew why, because then I could do something about making more of that happen. But there is something about the Ruby community that is friendly and personable and interested in the wider world about programming. You go to a JavaScript conference. Now, there are perfectly pleasant JavaScript conferences full of friendly people. It's a different vibe. It just is. And I can't tell you why. But I wanted to take that goodwill and friendliness and turn it into something useful, help people get their CVs right. And like my secret plan with it is that I'm matching people up geographically. So people are typically meeting people in their city. Now, there's no expectation that you would meet that person for the mentorship meetings. But you could. And if you do, you might meet them and go, wow, this person's really smart. You know, they're a bit rough around the edges, but we could take that person at my company. So that's my secret plan number one, which is that. And the second part of it is I want to pull out as much as I can a post bootcamp curriculum or a toolkit to help people hire folks straight out of a bootcamp. It's not my end game. My end game is to have the Ruby community be healthy and thriving and full of new people. And like some of the best people I know came out of bootcamps. Nadia, who's keynoting RubyCon for many, like I met her when she was literally about to start her first job at Pivotal in London. And now she's like taking on Amazon on her own and keynoting RubyConf for six, seven years, maybe longer. But like still like super impressive, right? So it's finding that first job and that we all know that first job is so important. We all look back on that first job going, oh yeah, that first job where I came into contact with Rails and suddenly I could do all these cool things. And this person really supported me. So it's kind of like trying to take some of that energy and give it to people who maybe aren't doing it as part of their job or they're looking to do some mentoring, which isn't, you know, they don't get the opportunity to work or they're looking to move up into a more senior role. And, you know, I think almost all senior roles, honestly, I don't think you're senior unless you are coaching people. And I don't mean necessarily having pastoral care over them, being their direct manager or having one-to-ones with them, but I don't think unless you are coaching and teaching and mentoring that you can really consider yourself to be senior. And I think it's one of the best skills you can build and lots of people don't have the opportunity. So why not? give it to someone in need because it's only three hours over six months. So go to firstrubyfriend.org and sign up now. Really long rambling advert. Thanks very much, champs. This is the end of the episode. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Hi, I'm Andrew Mason. I like Honey Badger and also firstrubyfriend.org. Whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, everyone has an outage from time to time. When your next outage occurs, transparency is critical. The difference between a minor annoyance that people soon forget and a fiasco that creates sustained resentment is in how you communicate. That's why you need Honey Badger. Honey Badger will be a crucial component of your incident response plan with their uptime monitoring service that now has an exciting new feature, public status pages. Create a new status page with custom domains, branding, and more. Don't let Twitter be the only way your users can find out if your app is down. Sign up for Honey Badger to improve your incident response with a shiny new status page that you will be proud to show your users. Visit honeybadger.io and start giving your users a better experience today and let them know Remote Ruby sent you. Thanks to Honey Badger for their continued support of Remote Ruby. I was really excited to see it. I think a lot of people were. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. I read that you had like hundreds of people sign up to Minute. There are currently 600 people in the program and it's about two thirds mentors, one third applicants right now. And the wow. benefit is, is that as people go through it, because I think you can mentor even if you're like a year out. If you're a year into your first job, I think you're ready to, in fact, in many cases, better positioned to explain to someone who you were like a year ago. You can help those people cross that bridge from, I can spin up a Rails app in a classroom setting to this is how you operate in a proper team. And they've got a weird React thing on the front end, or they've got a huge deployment in Kubernetes, like all of the, like the weird things for each company. You can push that energy back in. So I'm thinking that everyone who's an applicant right now in a year's time, I'm going to hit them back up and get, make them turn into mentors. So like this is web scale. That's what I'm talking about. You think Ruby doesn't scale? Well, let's see. And at the moment, it's just like me in a spreadsheet and mailing software. I have resisted. I didn't Rails knew my way out of this problem. I used stuff that normal people can use and just my organization to do it. So like a keynote expert, sheets expert, what can't you do? I'm proper business, me. You want to watch out. (laughs) I really think that you don't have to be mentoring people after X number of years. 
anybody who is like a week behind you, you can mentor. There's all kinds of things that you can mentor people on. And then like what they probably don't realize is how much they'll learn trying to teach the stuff they've learned over the last year and really forces them into like, well, how do I explain this? Like I understand it intuitively, but I don't know how to put it in words. And then like trying to explain it, they like will probably learn a ton doing some mentorship too. And my favorite and least favorite thing is when somebody much less senior than you says, why do you do this? And you have that moment of realization where you don't know why you do it anymore. And that's the beginner's mind, right? It's the sort of martial arts way to think about it, but it's purely just like, oh yeah, I don't know why we do that anymore. I've institutionalized that madness. So I need to either work out why I do it or stop doing it. Yeah. It's an interesting thing where you like get in your little habits of, do we just do these things because that's how they've always been done? And then the new person comes in and asks a very simple question and you're like, entire world is questioned now. And you're like, what? (laughs) I mean, I've got an example of that. So I work, we'd stop doing daily standups in person. There were various reasons, some of them organizational scar tissue from how those standups expanded to take up way too much time. So we're like, well, let's just do all written down. And she just said, why don't we do standups? And I was like, you know what? There is no reason why we don't do it. And it's nice to see faces in the morning. So let's do it. We're a small team. We can take the 10 minutes to say hi and check in on everyone and also work out what we're all doing every day. So yeah, it's that kind of outsider's mind that forces you to question yourself. As someone who is part of mentoring in the first Ruby Friends, there are some questions that I've been asked that I realize, oh, like I take some of this knowledge for granted almost. Things to me that seem simple or easy, kind of like trigger words almost. I don't know. It's been very refreshing. It's kind of resetting how I view the world. It's been nice. I've, yeah, I've, I've heard a lot about myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's the friends who make along the way, isn't it? Yes. I absolutely agree. You'd have to take a step back. And in some cases, you have to explain things much more simply than you even... When you're explaining it to someone who is an experienced developer, you can use shorthand that you just can't use with someone who's completely new to how active record works, or they feel like they want to understand the detail of the Rails magic. They want to understand it all so that they can be good at it. And I'm like, actually, you don't need to understand how Rails works every single part to use it. That's kind of what Rails is for. It's about David talks about conceptual compression and all of that good stuff. We're encoding ways that we can do things so we don't have to think about it, but then you need the skill to go, do you know what, now, right now for this problem, I do need to understand how this works. So it's the confidence to go, this is fine. I mean, this is true of my own code, right? I've been in the same job five years. I often will come to code and not understand how it works, despite the fact that the sole and only author is me. And the person who wrote the version before that was also me. That's no different for me using Rails. Like I don't understand how Active Record is put together, but I learn the tools to know that I don't need to know all the time, but then I can dive in and have a look. And that's the real skill. The real skill is in the forgetting. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's also been a lot of fun for me. So shout out Angela, who is my person I'm mentoring. We had a whole conversation about before we start recording how there's no good way to but the, I think the official word is mentee, but it does sound like a sea creature. So let's, and we, we, we talked my about friend. My, my friend, friend, my new friend, my new Ruby friend, my new Ruby friend. She always comes excited and with questions. And that's a lot of fun because sometimes you'll get on calls, not like in this case, but sometimes I get on calls and there's not like an agenda and I kind of like, I don't know, you feel like, okay, this isn't really beneficial, but this feels beneficial for both of us because she comes ready to ask questions about stuff she's worked on the past couple of weeks. And that makes it fun for me to like, I don't know, if I don't know, help her figure out an answer. The whole thing is very refreshing. I'm enjoying it. And it's not too heavy, right? It's not too much. It's not too heavy. It's not. So that's the key thing. Like if you sign up to this thing, it's not hours and hours of your day. And you can turn up as the mentor unprepared because the thing about a mentor-mentee relationship is that it's important for the mentee to turn up with questions and somewhat of an agenda because the mentor doesn't have the agenda. They're trying to help you as the mentee and they've been preparing their whole career. So that stuff is all in them. You're trying to pull that knowledge out. And so you must try and work out what you're hoping for. And it could be in some cases, you know, I know folks on the program are just trying to get a job. So a lot of that is like, well, let me help you with your CV. Let me run some interview stuff with you. Let me run some quick interview problems with you. What questions have you got that you feel you haven't answered well in previous interviews? So there's a lot of that. 
There's also a lot of, I just want to pair with someone and see how they do stuff. There's a lot of, I'm doing this thing at work, like you've experienced, Jason, where you just like, there's this particular thing that it, I wish I knew a bit more about how Active Record worked. Like how does that Active Record link up with Active Model, which links up with A Realm? And you know, the honest answer is, oh, I sometimes know that, but like, let me help you work it out on this call. <laughs> yeah. It's cool because typically, like a day before, she'll send me some notes of the questions so that if I have time, I can look and, like, I'm not kind of on the spot. And that's been really helpful too. It's fun. Our cadence is every two weeks right now. And Above and beyond. Yeah, it's good though, because like, I guess for me, like I would hate for her to have a question and then wait like a whole month to get an answer to it. And so, yeah, it's been great. It's not a calendar invite that's like, oh, you know, it's something you look forward to doing. That makes it, makes it joyous. It's like a one by four Tetris block falling. It's not like one yeah. of those horrible like Z shapes. I've never been able to relate to something so much in my entire life. Is that... <laughs> I have no further questions. <laughs> You're on now. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> so you said it's two thirds mentors, one third mentees. Yeah. Have you been able to get all of the applicants looking for mentorship paired up with someone? Or are you still? Yes. Them? Okay. I'm doing it once a month. So I'm literally after this call, I'm going to go to my spreadsheet and do the however many applicants I've got this month and try and match them up. Certainly in the US, it seems to be, I'm pretty close city-wise, although I've learned a lot of US geography, scanning on an Apple map, trying to put people geographically close together. You're and a photographer now. Uh, yeah. the other. Did you learn that the South isn't really like the actual South and the Midwest is like North and yeah, all those fun things? <laughs> <laughs> you crazy people get crazy geography. <laughs> yeah, and some folks are pretty close together. And then I've got some very generous Australian mentors who are getting sort of lots of bits of Southern Asia and Eastern Asia and stuff. So like the majority of folks are Europe, US. I'd love to get more mentors from non-Europe and US because I am starting to see applicants coming from all over. Like the mixture of folks looking for mentorship is a real mix of bootcamp folks, computer science grads, and also just like self-taught people who just want that help. And in many ways, they're the ones who need the most help because they don't have any formal structure around them. And so they tend to come from anywhere. So yeah, like, the more mentors I can get, the more closely I can match people. And hopefully over time, we'll get a bit more sophisticated in matching them. And hopefully over time, I'm sort of begging the mentors and the mentees in the emails to send me stuff that they're recommending and things that are working for them, because then I can take that and I can put it back in the emails for the next group of people to go through. The whole point is that it's just like software. Like I'm trying to create a system here to make this part of the process better before I fix the hiring market. <laughs> okay, so perfect. For my next question, you said you were not trying to fix the hiring process yet. Yeah. So have you thought about this? Have, oh, have... so much. Okay. Uh, so let's go. So I have been talking to lots of folks in our community and wider about hiring junior folks and how... Some people have had really good success with it. Still, if you talk to like your average, decent, mid-career senior person in a middle-sized company, and even some bigger companies, they're like, oh, hiring juniors feels so hard. It feels like we can't do it. It feels like we won't do a good... But the thing you hear most of all is fear that they won't do a good job. So what I want to do is get rid of that fear. Because frankly, junior developers are cheap in comparison to senior developers. I don't know the US market, but I think it's even more bonkers than the UK market for developer salaries, right? Like it's bonkers. And these people are desperate for work. They've made the difficult decision to change careers or they're coming fresh out of university or they're not even having the budget to be able to put themselves through boot camp. So they're self-teaching on the side amongst, you know, around their other job. And we do a bad job of bringing people through. And I think that's lack of, it's not really a lack of guts. It's a lack of confidence in our ability to work it out as we go. After RailsConf, as I said, I spent some time self-reflecting and thinking about coverage books. There's three of us in the dev team, front-end chat, designer chat, and that's the whole product team. I think we would do a great job for people because we care. The fact that you're afraid means you care. And therefore, what I need to do as part of this mentorship focus on junior stuff is A, walk the walk, which I'm doing, and B, provide some sort of toolkit for folks so that they can replicate this inside their own company with their own institutional madness, right? So in Coverage Book, we are 
not fully remote. We're remote friendly. So like we'll all be in the office two days a week, but we mostly work from home, but we're all on the South coast of the UK, but not in the same town. So for a company that's fully remote, different set of requirements. For a company that's fully in the office, different set of requirements. But there must be commonalities to what makes a good junior experience. And the things that I'm hearing are mentorship. So the more mentors I can create, the better. So that's a good thing. I'm hearing just like support, like an emotional support, a practical support, at time to learn. I think there's something about external mentorship as well. Certainly in smaller companies, there's definitely something about trying to work out whether your company is uniquely strange or whether what they're doing is normal. Yeah, I just think there's so much we could do that is universal to our companies and our organizations. So whatever I can do to pull that stuff out and then for create the circumstances where companies feel able to hire juniors, the better. Because why don't we make Ruby? If Ruby is the friendliest place for a mid-level developer, why shouldn't it be the most accessible place for a junior developer? Particularly as we have this bootcamp thing where they're teaching Rails to kids and career changers. So why don't we have a much better onboarding ramp for this stuff? And I guess, why not me? I like to talk. I don't know if you've noticed. I love that. We've talked about it on the show before. We talked about it with Adam Cuppy a while back. It, A, scares me that the community will over time. Like, I don't think like Ruby will die or anything, but like over time, it will dwindle if we can't not just bring new people in, but give new people jobs. It all flows from the jobs. You can't have a Ruby community if there's no one paying you to write it. Yes. And you've got great stuff like, you know, GoRails is a terrific educational resource. We have these, yeah, it's, yeah, the guys, I don't like the guys. Yeah, I've but, heard of it too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you have these educational resources and like Ruby's got a history of making these educational resources. Like GoRails is only the most recent and, you know, the pinnacle of the art form. You know, after you've been doing video stuff for years, there was your origin story as Rails casts, right, Chris? Like that's the, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing, nothing disappeared. And you were just like, well, I could do that. That's yeah, and it, it goes back to what we talked about earlier too. Like I was, I don't know, two or three years into like, doing rails. And I was like, well, at least I can make videos for people who are newer than me. And that was my only intention with it. And then here I am now, I've learned a tremendous amount just trying to teach things that I thought I knew and realized like, oh, it's actually a lot of nuance to the decision making and stuff. That's what the community I think in Ruby has been really good at just kind of people teaching. I came from Python and there wasn't screencasts and all of that. Like I was reading some random blog posts and things, but not the videos where I could watch and kind of consume the person's thought process. The tutorials that are written down are like, they're more rigid or whatever. You kind of consume like, this is the commands that I do and the process that I follow, but not why as much. And I feel like Ruby has always been so welcoming and willing for people to share that kind of Here's how we think about problems because the language is designed to let us think about problems really easily too. So I yeah, always like that about it. I think about peep code as this deep cut for those original video people there. Jeffrey Grossenbach was the peep code guy. He sort of preempted code streaming on Twitch. He had his videos that were sort of longer form explorations of certain Ruby features. And then he did some like code alongs with people like Aaron Patterson and other folks. I think I still have the video somewhere. I think there's a different kind of learning. It's interesting you just said you've written tutorials. Like a written tutorial is, that's a very copy-paste exercise and you can do it without using your brain and therefore when you get stuck, you get stuck. Whereas if you watch a video, although it's arguably a more passive experience, you're paying attention and you're able to give more context in a video. Like I feel like that's something that's a nice thing about that way of learning. But then of course, like books is the other. We've always had like great authors in our community. I just finished reading Sustainable Web Development in, with Ruby on Rails by David Copeland, which is terrific. Um, Amazing. So good. I nodded through about 80% of it and then viciously disagreed with 20% of it, as is completely correct for that kind of book. Also a really good follow on Twitter. Not mm, only yeah, yeah. book, but tweets, just a lot of really wise thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, I just think we can make Ruby a great place for these junior folks if we just show a little bit of guts. I love it. Speaking of guts, you wanted to talk about authentication. So, correct me if I'm wrong, you would like authentication built into Rails? It's a minor thing I've been pushing for very hard, yes. And what's your impression? Do you think Rails is resistant to this? So, I don't think necessarily Rails is resistant to it. 
That said, we had David on a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, I went straight for it. And he yeah. said that he views authentication as a application level concern. Like it's business logic-y. And I kind of stopped pushing on it after that. So now I just, you know. I think my impression is probably David is against it because Basecamp has never done it that way. So Basecamp, right. the app, Basecamp has its, well, they're not, they're not Basecamp anymore, are they? They renamed for some reason. Hayes obviously got email built in, so that's its own authentication system. But Basecamp and the previous 37 Signals apps all have this centralized yeah. Yeah, like a single thing. sign-on thing. So not only is it yeah. an, not only is it an application-related thing, it's also a separate application-related thing. Is that a microservice? I believe it to be a macro service. <laughs> Ooh. Mm. Or a mini lift is the other, that's my other, I like that. I hope people suck around for the spicy takes. Let's keep going. Yeah. So you're not going to get it coming out of Basecamp. You're not going to get it coming out of GitHub. They have their own thing. You're not going to get it coming out of Shopify. They have their own thing. So like many things in Rails for the beginner stuff, it tends to come out of Basecamp. So the sort of the non-enterprisey features that go into like Rails gets loads of amazing stuff from the GitHubs and the Shopify's and the Gusto's and all this stuff. But they tend to be like, want to cut your database in half because it's taking up 4,000 gigabytes? Do it this way, which is great and useful and brilliant when you get to that problem. But like the beginning stuff, like the hot wire stuff has all come out of Basecamp because they are able to think a little bit differently in that team and other smaller teams like them. I think for Auth to end up in Rails, it would need to be, someone's going to have to support it. And that's the main issue. I think they could easily bless something. Like Hotwire is not in Rails, but it is blessed. You have got solutions like you've got uh, Authentication Zero. Have you seen that? That's really nice. The fact is, I think it probably has to be a generator, right? Like, I don't think you want it built in. Right. And I did have a look at the Laravel docs on this, right? So first Laravel drop on the... I came prepared. Yeah, I came prepared. I was just like, here we go. There's three options in Laravel. That's the same problem that we have. We have device, which may not be to your taste, but is effectively the standard. So if we want to do something else, it's got to be better than compete with translate from device, right? So I think something like authentication zero or there was another chat, Steve. Yeah, Steve did, did, So he now he's a generator gem as well. Similar thing. Also, this is only useful in Rails new situations. This is the other reason. You need new businesses starting on Rails now. Are those new businesses ready to... This is another reason why Basecamp was a weird thing because they used to rewrite Basecamp every three years. They would literally Rails new their business every three or four years. No one else does that. So they would come across the same problems that beginners would come across. So I totally agree that it's a nice thing to have. I think we have decent solutions. I don't like Devise either, particularly. I think the hard part with Devise is that it's a weird mixture of Rack for Warden authentication and then like... Rails controllers that only seem to handle like the happy path. So like if you fail to sign in, it like fails on a rack level and then goes some other direction. So when you're looking at the Rails controller, it's not like a if success else this like you're used to. It's like, yeah, yeah, this just sent you down some other path. We don't even know where it's at really when you look at it. And then you're wrong. It's really really confusing. It's really clever. I just don't understand it. Yeah, and that's, that's a, I think, the thing. What I think would be really nice is just you could build, and I'm probably going to build this for fun, effectively something like Devise, but just use the authenticate by and the has secure password in Rails and then basically recreate the same controllers and views, just toss them in a gem. And you could have more or less the same like Devise experience where you just drop it in you don't have to worry about all of those things. And you could upgrade it as well. Cause like that's a trade off on the generator is like security fixes come in. What do you do? Rerun the generator and then like redo, you know, handle the merge conflicts or whatever. Like it gets tricky to, to manage those. But yeah, that was one thought I've had recently is like, yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to do effectively devise without the rack level stuff. Just do it all in Rails. And then I think you would solve a lot of the confusing bits of the whole flow there, which is like still not updated to turbo because it's kind of tricky with several things. The thing with the thing with the device stuff is that it generates some stuff and then doesn't generate other bits. You want to end up with the situation where you ended up with like a, I don't use it, but like the pay situation is like you manage everything. Yeah. The gem manages everything, the views, the thing, the thing you can't customize it. 
or you generate it and then you can customize it. And then it's like you said, with authentication, obviously the tricky bit is making security fixes to it. I don't think David's wrong. I think it is an application level concern, but it'd be really nice to have like a solution that was coherent and like maybe even a, this is how we would recommend to do authentications, yeah. which is, I think certainly from my reading, my pre-reading for this podcast, authentication zero seems to be pretty clear and clean. Like it's, it's really worth looking at how they do that and maybe even building on that, that stuff. I did take a look at that. We had Jose Falim on because obviously he created Elixir, but he was yeah. also the one who did a lot of the early work on device and yeah. working with the Phoenix framework for Elixir in the last couple of years, wanted to basically offer authentication. So the approach he ended up with was a generator. But my understanding was it was like a generator, but there's still some lower level abstractions that could be updated. For yeah. If there's a security fix, the lower level could be updated without like having to regenerate. I thought that was fascinating. I mean, we have some of that in Rails, like you know, has a key password and all that stuff, right? right? You could maybe wrap that in your own method and then maybe it's as simple as passing deprecation messages out when it needs an update. Maybe that's a way to do it. Who knows? I don't have the answer. I just think, who thought, you know, user password was an unsolved problem in the year 2022? Certainly not me. I think it solved elsewhere. <laughs> it, it's just one of those nice to have. I don't right? know. But- I mean... If Laravel's got three authentication methods, then is they've it solved? solved? Three to- they've solved it three ways. Oh, so, so they're just three times as good it. as us. <laughs> Think about it. It's just a nicety. So I built an app earlier this year and I went with the Rails has secure password approach and just built all the stuff myself in it. It really didn't take me that long. It was arguably better than like throwing device in and then a couple of months from now, needing Mm -hmm. like one obscure thing. I have to like override the controller and stuff like that. But yeah, I don't know how to solve it. I was scared you were going to tell me, oh, you should just champion that and like try to submit it. And then I was going to leave the podcast. So (laughs) this worked out. This worked out better. (laughs) It'll keep you busy. (laughs) No, it's interesting. I'll check out Authentication Zero. It's a gem. Yes, it's a generator gem. I think you can actually remove it after you've generated all your stuff. Like it's quite cool. It's just, it makes lots of decisions for you using Railsy defaults. I like it. Well, Andy, anything else that you wanted to chat about? Shout out. I could stay on for another hour chatting to you lovely gents, but I think primarily like find me on the internet, I suppose. Mostly sign up for firstrubyfriend.org. And, you know, if you want to get my sort of recently restarted newsletter at One Ruby Thing, that's at andycroll.com. And you can find all of my previous very small Ruby tidbits on there. And then, yeah, come to RubyConf Mini. It'll be ace and I'll be there. You can either talk to me if you want to or completely ignore me and I won't mind. Whatever is your taste. (laughs) Not you, you have to talk to me. Andy, I like talking to you. I'm less intimidated now that I know you're friends with my boss. (laughs) Surely that's meant to intimidate you even more. No, it was like, okay. If he's in Jamie's circle, he's all right. (laughs) He can't be that special. I don't know, (laughs) Jamie's... She was pretty badass. I like him. Yeah. Also, you mentioned one Ruby thing. That is one newsletter I always enjoy because it's literally one Ruby thing. So it's not, it's not like a newsletter where I'm like, oh, I have to read that. I'll get to it later. I can just like kind of parse through it and I've learned several things from it. So shout out to that. My pleasure. All right. Well, Chris, anything else? No, that's it. It was a good one. And yes, I think we could have easily gone for another okay, two, I've three, got, four hours, you know? I've got more stuff on my list. Well, let's just have you back. We'll do <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love to. Yeah, awesome. just give me All right. Thanks, gents. Much, much appreciated. Likewise. Yeah. And lo- lovely to chat at you rather than to you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>